These 10 games are amazing, but each of them have one rule that we just have to change if we're gonna play them. Now, before we jump in, rather than apologizing on every single number along the way, I just wanna say once at the I beginning, know. We're not saying we're smarter than the designers. We're not board game designers. We're not saying we can design a game that's good. It's just people have their own preferences, things they like in games. And just for us, these are rules that maybe bother us and we just prefer changing if we're going to play the game. Basically, you don't change these rules, these games aren't fun. And we're not your friend. That's right, let's do it. My number 10 is like many games on this list, a game I actually like. And this one has a strong chance of being on your list as well. And that is Everdell. And at the very top of the Evertree are these <laughs> cards that I've never used in a game unless you just randomly happen to get a card with that. So basically there are these end game condition cards that say you have to have a historian and this building or they're normally a combination of two things. Maybe if you played it a lot, there's some deep strategy there. I've noticed lots of games, like I don't even have the opportunity to get them. If I do, they're only worth a few points and maybe they were just put there so the tree could be taller. That's my conspiracy theory. <laughs> That's why they're there. And I just leave off that branch of the tree. <laughs> it doesn't look pretty without just it. Don't, actually, I don't play the tree at all. Just leave it out so everyone can see the whole board. Okay, before I give you my number 10, I have to let you know that my list actually has a specific order. And the order is from this bothers me the least to this bothers me the most. So my number one is like, this really bothers me. I don't want to play the game because of this. But my number 10, it's more of a casual frustration. So, my number 10 is featured in a game called Agricola. And let me give you some logic. If you have one of something, can you make a baby? But if you have two, can you make a baby? Uh -huh. Yes. Three, still one baby. But for some reason, you can have more. You can have six of one animal, but you're just getting one baby. And I know it would throw off the balance if you just changed this rule. I get that. But it's really annoying to me. I want every pair to produce an offspring. It drives me crazy. To give some context, you're collecting animals in the game you've never played before. And if you get two sheep in every season, every year, I guess, you get an extra sheep as a way to build up sheep. But when you get four, you still get one. If you have <laughs> 10, you still get one. Yes. So. <laughs> it's so annoying. Just thematically, it drives me crazy. We get it mechanically, but yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's a little odd. I'll just let you know as well, since you let us know how your list was ordered, my list was completely random. I just shuffled them all up. Cool. Not really. Yeah, okay, my yeah. number nine has everything to do with just game balance. This is Isle of Cats. And Isle of Cats has this kind of cool drafting system where everyone gets cards. You draft some cards, you pass them, you draft, which we've seen before in games. But there are some cards in Isle of Cats that's so powerful. And I just, it bothers me that it's so random. So these cards, that, have, you, have you played before? No. Okay, you can get permanent baskets to let you go rescue the cats. Yeah. Or you can be paying for cards every turn to get those baskets to rescue the cats. The permanent baskets are so nice. And if you get dealt one, you're going to take it. You have a huge advantage in the game. I don't have a fix for this one. It's the one thing that keeps me from saying I really like Isle of Cats. I would say Isle of Cats is a mid-row, middle row, mid-tier mid experience for me. I'm fine playing it. I'd have a good time playing it, but it's not a game I really seek out. And the biggest thing is I feel like there's just too much randomness in the card draw. If you get the lucky cards, you feel kind of guilty. You're just kind of like, oh cool, I have four permanent baskets and you didn't draw a single extra one. I won. <laughs> so. Anyways, I like cats, random card drafts, not my favorite thing. As someone who hasn't played the game, I can say that I completely agree. My number five is a little- Five. Why did I say five? <laughs> five nine. and eight looks similar. Nine. nine. My number nine refers to a specific mechanic, Okay. but I'm gonna call out Gloomhaven in particular because it actually frustrates me the most. Now Gloomhaven is a game that I love, but it's a cooperative game where you just, for no good reason, can't share items. Now, mm. this can make sense in different contexts that you mm. can't share items, like in games where you're across the world from each other. But in Gloomhaven, you're a party going on adventures with each other, right. and you just, you're not allowed to share items in between missions or during missions. There's no passing money, no passing items. The game rulebook almost feels like they want you to be at odds. Like, it constantly is, like, having you, like, don't tell them your personal mission, your personal quest. <laughs> I'm like, is anyone getting together and like, let's play this massive co-op game with 90 something missions. For a year. And like, for like a year of our lives and be like, man, I'm really gonna pull one over on Ryan this week. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Like, it's just, it's really frustrating. Like, if I get a cool sword, but I'm, like, just going to be magic. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah I'm yeah, going to yeah. be at range. I'm not going to, like, use this melee thing, and you are. And to be like, no, your only option is to sell it to the store at half price, and you have to buy it at full price. <laughs> That's so stupid. Just stupid. let me pass items. That's just stupid. change the rules. That's stupid. It is straight up not fun. It's like in a video game. You're like, we're about to fight the final boss, or everyone will die, and the <laughs> yeah. store owner's like, that will be 600 gold. <laughs> 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 They're right there. The it's, dragon is coming. They're right there. <laughs> it's so good. Okay, my number eight is almost a category, but it's not a category. It is when end game scoring has too much effect on the outcome of the game. So the game mm -hmm. I chose for this is Suburbia, because I like Suburbia. Mm -hmm. The biggest thing that bothers me sometimes is if I start playing it too often. If I come back to Suburbia a few times a year, I continue to like it. If I play it too often, you start realizing that there's all this cool stuff. You wanna go for civic buildings, like the real government. If you try to have more features in your city that the government offers, it costs you money, but people like your city more. Or you can just try to have more commercial or factory, which is, not as popular, but it makes you money. You should have more residential, which is hard to maintain. All these decisions, but lots of your decisions come down to, can you get the end game scoring tiles? Because at the end of the game, you're like, we worked really hard and we got to 40 population. I have 35 yeah. and you're like, and I got 45 in end game scoring. And oh, yeah. I don't want to play a game in general for an hour. And then where you do accumulate score the whole time, but it just pales in comparison to that end game score. So the whole yeah. game is just focused on that. So. It's not always bad, but I with Suburbia, I could almost just do without them. Suburbia is still a great game. I just don't like it in general. So I, I wish all those endgame scores were cut in half. Yeah. I'd like it more. Yeah, I agree. This is really frustrating, a game where like, it makes it feel like everything else wasn't, not completely invalidated, but yeah. it was so weak compared to what happened at the end. Kind of like the whole like family feud, the points are tripled, like anyone's still in it. I, I know they want to keep people in it, they don't want player elimination, but sometimes I'm like, but I want a little more validation when I'm doing turn to turn. Yeah. My number eight is a game where I would almost bet money you forgot that this is a rule. Carcassonne has a very specific rule that you cannot draw your tile until the other person yes, has played yes. their tile. Again, my early ones here are more like pet peeves, like this is just dumb, change the rule. Yeah. And this is definitely in that category of like, especially if you're playing two player, draw the tile. We don't want Carcassonne to take longer. Carcassonne is not a game you want to play for two especially hours. Especially if you're playing four player though, everyone yeah. can think. The, yeah, even yeah. more so, yeah, yeah. Now you can't draw ahead too far, right? But you can draw at least one person ahead and you can do two person ahead. So there's really no problem with drawing tiles ahead. I don't know why the rule book doesn't allow for it, but it's a really bad rule that most people have thrown out and they don't even realize they're doing it, I think. Mm -hmm. I don't know, this I is kind of like old card games where you're not supposed to draw early because it does require you to sometimes bluff. People are like, well, what'd you draw? But as long as you don't do that to each other, yeah. you know, you can just draw early and it just keeps the game moving. <laughs> yes. My number seven, I have a strong feeling. In fact, I know it's on your list, unless you just forgot it. And that is Small World. Because Small World is a basically pure strategy game where you are trying to pick a race and a special ability, really fun combinations. Kind of the, the appeal is like every game you have different combinations of things that get together. You're trying to kind of control areas of the map. You go off the board, you come back on, all this fun stuff. But at the end of your turn, you can just roll a dice sometimes and capture an extra territory. Yeah. And it feels so random when you do it. And I don't know, I, I always feel like kind of dirty about the part of the game. Yeah, my one guy took it at the end because I rolled the best yeah. number on the dice. It's just a little bit risk-like at the end. Yeah, Yeah, I think it's frustrating because it's especially bad in a game where it doesn't feel like it belongs. Yeah. Like that's what really gets me about it in Small World. It's like, it just like wanted you to have, like not waste that last guy, and I don't know. Maybe someone said, "Hey, for the game to be more smooth, let's add a little randomness." Maybe it was intentional. It was, yeah. I could see, I could see it being like, I'm "Hey, sure we need a need a little randomness so it's not too count outable because there is an issue where you can purely figure out everything." I just in this one, I do just house rule and just leave it out. I just don't, wow. I just don't do it. I don't do the dice. I leave it in the box. Spect. For me, we're veering into mechanics that I think are beyond pet peeves but actually are kind of bad, and I would almost always change these. If someone didn't want to do it, sure. I mean, I'll go along with anything, but these are definitely getting into, like, I have to change this. So my number six is Pandemic. Pandemic Ooh. has a dozen your great favorite ways games. To Not my favorite game. Well, for a long time, it was your favorite game. Yeah, Pandemic. It, was, it was my first, I think, like many people that got okay. into, like, the board game hobby. I hate yeah, saying yeah. that. 
But I think Pandemic was like that nice gateway. It was like my game. Yeah. I was like, it was cool. I was showing it to everyone. Yeah, great game. Yeah. Pandemic has many great, clever ways to lose. But it has one dumb way to lose. And it has just a timer that the game doesn't need. So if you just run out of cards in the player deck mm-hmm. to draw, you'll just lose. But it's really frustrating because it actually fights against the theme. So I've had games where like we're on the brink of eradicating everything. And like there's almost no disease left in the world. And then we just like run out of cards by a turn. It's like it's the most disappointing way to lose because yeah. it I mean playing against the clock is a strategy. Yeah. But to me, it's not really an exciting one in there because the disease taking over the world is already enough of a right. clock. Like that building up and escalating yeah, yeah, yeah. and outbreaking. That's what you should be fighting against. If they felt like the game wasn't quite hard enough, they should have just made the diseases a little bit stronger. I don't like the player deck limit. I'll just reshuffle, and I'll do more epidemics in it as well, so it gets you know harder. But like for me, I'm just willing to reshuffle because I don't like when the player deck runs out. It's super unsatisfying way to lose to me. It's very thematic. It's when your government funding stopped. <laughs> Sorry, no more funding. But we've almost done it. No, it's... <laughs> Government funding ran out. Yeah, if that was in the rule book, I'd respect it a lot. <laughs> My number six is Above and Below. And I really like Above and Below. It's a fun game with some simple mechanisms and cool narrative elements. The thing I don't like about it is very, very simple. There is purchasing new villagers. And it's nice that the villagers don't have equal strength. Yeah. Now, it also has one of these sliding scales that as you purchase villagers, the cheaper ones, the more expensive ones slide over. A lot of games do this. It's great. Yes. Above and below's issue, though, is which we have seen more times than you want, yes. is if on the first turn the, the, the villagers are not the same strength. Some are actually over three times better than others. If that good one is in this spot or this spot, the first player almost just wins as long as they play it out right because you get a great person that costs you two coins. The next player, if they want to buy any villager at all, is going to buy an inferior villager yeah. at three or four. But just simply, if one of those ones that are way out of proportion come out first. It just yeah. almost feels like game over. Now, it's a narrative game, so you should play it just for fun to enjoy the stories anyway, but if you want to play it mechanically, you almost need to just reshuffle if that comes out first, because mm-hmm. then later on, if it comes out in the five spot, you have to spend five coins for it. That's expensive. It's, it's a decision you're making, but you get on turn one, you get to use that villager for every turn of the game and it only costs you two. Yeah. The other person can't even acquire an inferior village unless they want to spend more for it. It just kind of throws it off. And that, that's the kind of thing that I know rule books in general want to simplify. Everyone's like, oh, simplify, simplify, yeah. simplify. And I'm like, that could have been one that could have just been one line. They could just say, hey, if you get one of these three, throw it back in and take another one out. Really simple, and that's what yeah. I would do if I played the game. I, especially if I was going first and I was teaching someone new, I'd be like, I can't do this to you. Yeah. You know, just let's just put that back in the pile. My number six should have been my number seven, but I read them in the wrong order. So, <laughs> my number six is a game called Sheriff of Nottingham. Oh, I didn't Sheriff think of Sheriff of Nottingham is a really good game. It is, like, one of my favorite just straight-up bluffing games, and it has a serious problem. You shouldn't lie. Oh, yeah. It is really broken in balance. I should put this on my so list. I didn't consider this. you never should lie during the game. There's a simple quick change to the rule that you can do, and that's double the value of all the contraband in the game. Yep. Then it makes sense to lie sometimes. But if you don't, it's just a much safer game to not lie. And as soon as everyone knows that, there's no fun in the game because the no. whole point of the game is trying to catch someone's bluff. My number five, it's a game I often call my favorite game of all time. It's a game I've definitely liked for the longest. Yeah. And that is Seven Wonders Duel. Oh. Seven Wonders Duel. Now this won't matter if you only are going to play the game five or ten times. But there is something that can happen in the game that I don't want to say is broken because it's such a solid game. You don't want to use that word. But there is a significant first player advantage mm-hmm. if certain cards come out in the wrong order. So basically, yes. again, don't worry about this if you only play it five or ten times. But we have played it, I've played it 50, 100 times. And something can happen where the first player, first of all, gets the first dibs on the cards. It has this sort of solitaire as you flip over cards and take them. The cards underneath them get revealed. 
Something that can happen if the first player wants to, wants to know how to do this, you can get first dibs on all the revealed cards in the mm -hmm. first round. And you can just, because you can draft the ones that force the other player to always reveal them. Which someone might say, well, then just they can use a go again, but you can use a go again, flip it back to your favor. It's really yeah. easy to, to manipulate that entire first round. And you can always manipulate so you're the first player in the second round if you want to. Yeah. The problem is in the first round, there are these gold cards, which are just the best cards in the game. And it's, doesn't all the time, but maybe two out of every 10 games, the first player gets two of these gold cards. And that just wildly throws off the game. Now, there are other strategies. If you're the second player, you need to go for green cards, but the first player can grab one too, because they get they see all the cards revealed first. It just really throws off the game. So the rest of the game, the first player can now get a lot of money if they want to with the gold cards. And also they get price fixes, so nothing ever costs yeah. them money. You just have to play it safe now, don't let them win anything. It's pretty easy from that point forward. So I actually have a fix now I do with the game. I tried originally adding one extra card because one extra card threw off the turn order. So you're a first mm -hmm. player, but they got to reveal the cards for them. But I didn't like that because it messed up the cards that are available yeah. to draft. So what I went to now is the first player gets five coins which I thought was brilliant because the first player could always dump a card and make up those lost coins rather than seven. You start with seven. So they get seven, first player gets five. So it's yeah, kind of equal because you, you lose about half a turn because later on you can dump a card for probably four or five coins. So you kind of make it back. But the biggest thing it does if you do five, the gold cards cost three each. Yeah. You can buy one gold card. If you get really lucky and flip another one, you can't buy that card. You might be able yeah. to dump it so your opponent can't get it. It just kind of avoids the biggest thing that can go wrong in the game. So you don't have to. I'm not saying it's like a thing. And if you want to play it five times, it's not going to matter yeah. 10 times. But if you play it a lot, you just start to kind of, you, you start getting to it and you go, oh man, it's going to be one of those games. It just avoids that. So you start with five coins. And if anything, maybe the first player now is going to be slightly worse. That's okay. And rather than being significantly better, they're slightly worse or maybe equal. So I like it. Start with five coins. My number five. He's Seven Wonders Duel. Really? What? <laughs> no. <laughs> For a different reason. Really? We're both about to dog on a game we both really like. Yeah. yeah. So I say this is the problem is snowballing. And yeah. the issue in Seven Wonders Duel, a rule I always now change, is Seven Wonders Duel has a rule where you can only build seven wonders. So one player gets to build four wonders and the other player gets to build three. Yeah. I find that more often than not, the player who gets to build four will win the game. And they snowball a little bit, especially if you were really depending on that fourth wonder to activate yeah. a special power like a military advantage yeah. or a change turn. And I find that it swings too much of the balance of the game where I don't like the snowballing that much. So it's like the person we just like gets to have another like step forward. So yeah. I've actually for a long time just changed this rule and allowed both players to build all four of their wonders. So it's now eight wonders duel, which is a much worse title. Joel's number five. This Eight Wonders of the World Duel. That's right. We are in crossover world right now because my number four is also oh, a crossover. Seven I think, Wonders Duel? No. <laughs> okay. No, I think this is a final crossover. I'm okay. pretty sure. Wow. My number four, though, is Pandemic. But oh. for a different reason, completely wow. different reason. The thing that bothers you about Pandemic, probably more than anything else, and this is going to sound petty, is the hand limit at the lower player count. Yeah. So when you're at a lower player count, you have to basically have so many of a card to trade yeah. in and cure the diseases. And the, the, the expansion that kind of addresses this too. Yes. But but if you're just playing a classic game, you need so many bunches of cards and your hand limit is seven, I think. Yeah. And two players is one of the most frustrating way to lose is to be like, I didn't draw four or five, whatever you need of one, but I have like two or three of each. So you're dumping cards and then you can't ever win because when the player deck runs out, the timer's done, so you can yeah. only dump. It's just, I would rather the game be way harder. Like yeah. throw in like two more epidemics. I want to lose that way. I want to lose from the world yeah. being taken over, not from like, well, we have to dump a card. And if we don't draw another one of that color, we have to lose because there's no route to winning it now. Yeah. So it's just my favorite way to lose a game. It, it doesn't matter four as much because four, you have enough people on the map to be able to trade with each other. Yeah. But two, you often have to split up. Someone has to be in Asia. Someone has to be in South America. You can't just be like, let's waste four turns and trade a card with each other yes. to make this work. So anyways, hand limit. I, I just don't love it at the low player count. I'd rather be yeah. not there. All right, my number four is actually a category, but I do have some specific examples okay. that drive me crazy. And this category is Pointless communication rules. You can't say this. You can't share this card. So, some bad ones for me. I'm going to call out Gloomhaven again. I like Gloomhaven a lot. Great game. Gloomhaven? You wasted so much of your life playing Gloomhaven. I wasted so much of my life playing Gloomhaven. Gloomhaven is particularly bad. 
Battlestar Galactica, which is my number one game as of our last, like, last year's, like, favorite games, has a really bad one oh, where you're, I don't you're know allowed to... One. So you're allowed to communicate how you feel about how you can contribute. Oh, okay. And Shadows Over Camelot has the same thing. You can say, I can kind of help with this. Oh, I could really help with this. It's, like, so annoying. It's, like... A, so the yeah. rule is, like, either don't let me say how many cards I can contribute or do. But this right. whole, like, you can't say that you can contribute, you, can't you know, say. a significant amount. But, you know, you're like, I can go kind of in. So That's one, up... two, three, four, five, right? Yeah. Right. So I can barely help. One. <laughs> it's like I, I can kind of help. Exactly two. middling help. You oh, know? Yeah. I can help. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I find these kind of talking rules to just be more often just like pointless barriers to fun so yeah just don't abide by them if you don't and have lots to. of party games have them too something like that yeah. where you can't say certain things and you're like well sorry i thought we we're trying to tell jokes and be funny and yeah that's yeah. a good one i not i'll have that on my list that's a good one number three i'm going to pick on one of the most popular board games in the world uh -oh. that we've already done that some i guess but i'm going to pick <laughs> on scythe scythe oh. i actually really like scythe you even played it much recently, yeah, I know. You need, you need to experience it again. Right. It's a really cool game. And it's one of these games where basically like, I feel like, hey, we like upgrades, right? Everyone likes upgrades. Let's have a game where the whole basic is you have four different things you do and they're all upgrading. So you're upgrading yeah. four tracks at once. So it becomes this big number crunch of, okay, I'm trying to get, what's the best, most efficient way I can get my empire up and running? You can also conquer the map. And the winner is some combination of map you've conquered, upgrades you've done, missions you've accomplished, things like that. Yeah. There's something called a popularity track. And if you've played Scythe, you can skip ahead to the next number if you want to, because you already know this complaint. <laughs> some people love it, some people hate it. I liked it the first two or three games, but then I just found it was a mechanism that you're just mining. The popularity track is your multiplier. So if you basically just go out and kill a bunch of villagers or the people of the land, other people's villagers are the people of the land too, you're not very popular. So your multiplier for territories you own and other things you've accomplished is not that high. So I guess it's kind of interesting when you first play, but after a while you just kind of, okay, I'm going to burn an action and get a popularity or just yeah. get a popularity here. And it just, I don't know, I kind of want to punch people in the mouth a little more in the game it just kind of more just restricts movement where you're like ah it's a waste of popularity turn so again if you like it and you find that strategic i'm not hating on you it's just like this is actually i don't have an alternative because you kind of have to have it in the game or else it would just be all war game just straight out kill people yeah. um so I, I don't have a solution this is i don't have i'm not presenting a solution it's just the one thing that keeps me from like i really believe it would be a top five game for me yeah. maybe higher but i'm always like uh, I'm just going to have to mine my popularity at least to whatever the second threshold is and maybe to the third one. And it's not my favorite thing. Yeah. I don't remember. <laughs> I have no solutions. This is actually more just... You're me. supposed to offer a rule to fix it. <laughs> That's this is the more, point of the list. This is more just me being sad because I think I would like the game more without <laughs> it. It really does kind of disappoint me. I just think it's an amazing game. Yeah. That's always a little bit of a... Let's just, let's just play it right now. We'll get back to this list later. Okay. <laughs> it's an amazing game. All righty, Ryan. Before I continue, I want to remind you and ask you to please keep your hands to yourself because it's about to heat up in here. Okay. Oh, you're going to um, go after one of my games? I'm going to go after one of your favorite games and it's really something I truly hate about it. Viticulture. Visitors. I hate them. I hate them so much. So Viticulture is... Jamie one... Stegmeyer, if you're watching this video, sorry for picking on your games back to back. It was not planned. Oh yeah, I did. We love your games. I, so I think Viticulture is a really good worker placement game. Maybe one of the best ever. But when I look at the board, I am not very good at the strategy relative to you. But like chess, I can see everything that's happening and play the game. But then I go try to buy visitor cards and I get garbage I can't do anything with. And you go there and you get great stuff, it seems. Now, you would say you just have to know what's coming and when to use them. But that's frustrating to me because I'm like, I can see everything else happening on the board. It's like an open game, you know? Other, like The only thing I don't see is like your things you could build, right? It's like, to me, it's just right. very frustrating. It's like, there's some cards. They're completely random what garbage you're going to get. And like... I could go through, I don't get to play the game often, so like I could go through for the one or two times a year I get to play it and like try to memorize the cards to know like what are my odds of getting something I'm going to need at this time. And it's just frustrating because it's like the least clear thing in the game. It's completely random. I just wish the game didn't have it. Like I wouldn't imagine a world where Viticulture was just 
the regular game and there's no visitor part to it. Like that was just like mm-hmm. not part of the game. Yeah, I think so without it, it would become more of a pure strategy game. So it probably depends on what you want out of it. I think it does add that little bit of like there's more than one place to fill an order. It could mm-hmm. be done through a visitor card. But I, 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 they are random. It is probably the number one complaint about Viticulture. I like it, but you're right. It's one of those things where once you know the potential that's out there, you know if you're dealt a certain blue card, like, okay, I got to hold on to that one for this reason. If you don't know the potential of them, then yeah, I'd say you need to play a few times. But it is kind of like a barrier to being good. <laughs> Which I'm not. <laughs> My number two is a category of games. And these are co-op games oh. with just clearly bad draws that can waste one player's turn. And this, what always kind of bothered me a little bit, it's not horrible in pandemic, but sometimes in pandemic, there's a little bit of tension. It's kind of like, well, you haven't contributed much. It's like, cause I've drawn three of the epidemics. <laughs> I don't have any cards to work with, Yeah. but there's worse examples. I just played a kid's game recently where if you're the one who draws, it was pandemic style. You sometimes you draw yeah. stuff, but sometimes the good stuff, you get a bad stuff in the good stuff. If you draw the bad thing, you're forced on your next turn to spend your turn doing the bad thing. So I'm like, and there's an easy fix for this. If you do that, that's fine. You could say, okay, if you draw the bad thing, do the bad thing, but let that person then take another turn because there's a co-op game. It doesn't matter who draws the card. Yeah. It seems so simple, but it's just like, so we played this, a kid's game. It was one of the adults, thankfully, but four out of five turns were wasted. I'm like, how not fun is that? There's a lot of games, like Your Heart Hunts, the kid's game, where you could be the one that draws the boat. Yeah, that's and true. A, a great fix would be let the player draw again. Yeah. It's an easy fix. So yeah. any, but it's, this can happen not always in kids' games. Sometimes games can just be like, oh, I, I drew the bad thing, so yeah. I don't get to do anything fun. And other people are having so much fun, and they're like, oh, I have these cards I can do this with, and you're just kind of like, yeah, I, I drew one of the bad ones, so my turn was spent making things worse for everyone. No, maybe they're afraid of you drawing another bad card. Maybe, like, yeah. Let's not pile on. But I don't know, it, maybe it seems like not super dramatic for my number two, but it really kind of gets me, like, especially for games for like new people to the hobby, or for kids games. Yeah. I feel like it's a simpler mechanism to not have an alternative, but that's the worst time to do it. Like to have someone who's newer to board games be like, oh yeah, you're the one who ruined the team. Or you mess <laughs> up. Or for a kid's game to be like, like why don't we just not ever do that? That should yeah. never happen. You shouldn't play a co-op game and you be the one to screw it up by. I mean, you make bad moves and you screw it up. Yeah, we can all hate you. But just because you drew bad cards, like you just don't get having much fun now because you don't have cards available for you to do fun things with. You just, yeah, yeah hurt the game. All I heard there was, if we're playing a co-op and you make a bad move, I have permission to hate you for it. I never make a bad move. <laughs> Alrighty, now that I've made an enemy at this table, I'm going to make an enemy out of you. Next up, game is Shadows Over Camelot. Oh, you already mentioned it once. I know, but this one is specific okay. to this game. This game has the worst trader mechanic I've ever dealt with. I, You should not play. The rule fix is don't. Don't play the game. No, the rule fix is to get rid of the trader. Only thing you can do is the trader. The only thing is to play poorly. You're given no That's mechanisms true. to work against. So you basically spend your game like trying to kind of contribute without That's being it. too fishy. But you don't really get a mechanism to like actually fight back or undercut. A game like, you know, Battlestar Galactica, you actually actively seed cards. Yeah. You could try to manipulate people to try to do things. Right. There's... Basically, or you can totally turn on them and just be or, the bad yeah, guy. You can just yeah. Go be bad, right? But in Shadows Over Camelot, you just kind of like don't play good. That's yeah. your game if you're bad. It's so uninteresting to be the bad guy. I know it, it gets a lot of respect for being the first like real yeah. trader mechanic in a game, and I think that's awesome. And I think a game can be important for that reason. I'm glad it existed, but I do think this particular game is better if you just take that rule and you go. Whoop. So what would you suggest doing instead? Just don't play with the trader mechanic. It's oh. actually random in that game. You don't always get a trader gotcha. in Shadows gotcha. of the Camelot. Gotcha. So because of that, the game is actually has a good enough challenge, in my opinion, okay. where you don't need it. The game obviously can plays where it can play where there's not a trader. So just never play with the trader. Just gotcha. don't play with it at all. And it's I think it's a much better game for it. Okay, my number one, when we first started talking about making this list, like you actually suggest this list. When you first did it, I was like, I don't know if I have 10 games. As I thought about it, it was pretty easy but there was this one was like one of the first one to come to mind and i was like this actually this is a category that has always bothered me about board games one of the most biggest frustrations most biggest frustrations i have about board games and that is games lots of games are two to four players and they don't adjust for player count 
Yeah. And this makes me so frustrated. So I have three games with cards that all frustrate me for this reason. Harry Potter, Hogwarts Battle, Wayfarers of the South Tigris, Whoa, and um, Dune Imperium. Whoa. Dune Imperium. When you play these games, they all work at two players. But when you play them at two, the cards don't churn out. And, yeah. and some of these are competitive, some of these are cooperative, yeah. but it's the same issue. You play a two player game and you're like, oh yeah, these yes. cards, there's four cards out here we both can buy or five cards. And you're like, none of us want those, but there's no way to get rid of them. Yeah. So someone has to take the hit and buy a bad card. The next person to turn a card flips out they like. And you're just like, so especially in a two player game. Yes. And again, you could just say, well, these Dune Imperium didn't work as well too, which I don't think it works as well as two but two's on the box. Like, why don't yeah. we have some way of clearing cards? Same with Hogwarts Battle. Like when we play two player, often we just say, yeah, we get one clear a game. Because at some yeah. point you're just buying bad cards and making your deck building less fun. Yeah. It's not the only example. Um, there's a fun game called Dice Manor where you're, I don't know if you ever played yet, yeah. but you're bidding on properties. It's really cool. At four players, you are all just dying for properties. At three, everyone just kind of gets properties because what they should have done, I'm uh, sorry, two and three, yeah. but at two players, they really should have just said, hey, every round, there's just six properties. Remove three of them so there's still that intense competition. Instead, yeah. you just get whatever properties you want. It's a different, totally different feel of a game. So huh. if you make a game two to four, I really appreciate when you read a game that says, add two players, just take this out. Remove these cards or shuffle in these instead or just do a little thing you can say, okay, it's adjusted and balanced. It's not that here's two to four, it just works better at four, but if you want to play it at two, it's out there. Just make it, make it work. Yeah, I agree. It's an absolutely a problem in a lot it's of games. It's really frustrating. Sometimes it can even be a problem at all player counts, just card churn, but yeah, specifically this needs to be adjusted. Yeah. player account like at, it just it needs to be adjusted yeah at four you're like i can take one you might take it they okay i'll come around but at two you're just it's just back and forth and you're like well i'll take the bad card again so yep. or you need a card there's like a hundred cards and you're only going to go through 10 in a two-player game so you might need some cards for your strategy but you just don't see the cards not available if you've watched any of the other top tens from us on this channel you may think that i have it out for a certain game <laughs> It's not Blood Rage this time. Okay. It's not Blood Rage. I don't Rage. know where you're going with this. Blood Rage, great game. Love it. Wouldn't change a thing. <laughs> Mwah. Okay. This is a category, but I'm going to go after the two games I always go after okay. that are the worst defender. This is the thing that boils my blood. Like, rules that actually, like, physically, I'm like, I don't want to do this game this way. Like, Man, I this build-up is crazy. I would not do this. Like, I don't want to participate in this because this is anti-fun. It's the antithesis of fun. It is... Games that have timers oh. that punish you for enjoying the game that they oh, made. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I hate it. I know I've ranted about this in other videos. But We're sorry. Two Biggest Defenders, the worst of all. Time Stories. And then the next up is Mansions of Madness. Yep. I think Mansions of Madness is a decent game. Time Stories, eh. But they both are games with rich, exciting worlds and stories they throw you into that you should be, you should be excited. You're like, I want to explore all this cool content they created. And then if you do that, you're an idiot. You just lose. So yeah. like there's arbitrary timers made up because they I don't think they knew how to make a challenge in those kind of games. I should say they didn't know how. The ch challenge they decided on was a timer. Yeah. And I don't think it was it's a very good decision because the result is you create a game that's all about exploration and learning and reading. But then when you do that, you just become a loser. So the best way to play these games is to optimize a route through and don't explore, and don't, don't enjoy investigate. the world, yeah. And it's just like, it's so against what the game suggests that it's about. I mean, yeah. Mansions of Madness sells stories. Yeah. Like, they're like, go on Steam and buy more stories and adventures. Yeah. And I don't, it's really more than anything boils my blood. So if you can, just throw it out. Just don't play with the timer. Yeah. You lose that way, don't worry about it. Just explore the world. These are games about exploration and adventuring. It's not about some crazy challenge. Like, you don't want to be spending all your time fighting in Mansions of Madness. That's not the good part of that game. Another fix for Mansions of Madness that we've actually done is rather than get rid of the timer because it's kind of hard with the app, just make your movement speed double. Solves all the problems. Nice. I really need to get this rant from you 
and just like take it and green screen it. So next time it's one of our top 10, you can be like, and then, hi guys, I'm Joe. And here's what bothers me about Mansions of Madison Times. So just like, you know, have it just pop up every time you go to that you little green. my blood rage Yeah, my yeah, yeah, we'll right take care of all of them at once. This one really makes me angry. Yeah, it I'd agree. Really I, I didn't think about that, but that could be my top 10, yeah. Yeah. I said it once at the beginning and I will reiterate it once more. We're not saying that we think these designers are bad. We're not saying we make better games than them. It's just no. in video games, they get modded all the time. And the better the video games, the more specific people are. I want to make this game meet my flavor of a game. It's a yeah. good thing. So yeah, it's a good thing. It's an honor. It's really, it's, we're, we're not saying that we these games are terrible. Well, you said a couple of them a are terrible. Of them are. <laughs> a couple. But in general, in general, we're just saying, hey, to meet our personal kind of flavor, what we want out of this game, these are some rules that we like to tweak. Sometimes you want more baby cows. Sometimes you want more baby lambs. It's just how life goes. Context clues are important. See you guys in the next video. Later.